All righty, folks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is Dr. Kaz, and I am here with our third and final installment of the respiratory system. We're going to continue on and talk about the exchange of respiratory gases. Previously, we talked about internal respiration. Now we're going to talk about systemic gas exchange. All right. Um, I, excuse me, I misspoke. Previously, we, we talked about external respiration. All right, what was going on in the lungs? Now we're going to talk about systemic gas exchange, otherwise known as internal respiration. So we're basically going to talk about what happens between our respiratory gases right, when the blood arrives to our systemic uh, tissues, cells, right, via the systemic capillaries. So again, similar concepts here are going to be at play. Keep in mind, we're dealing with pressure gradients that plays a huge role in driving this process. So the partial pressure gradient, all right, is going to be at play here. So when we look at the values here for our oxygen, right, we'll see in the cells, it is 40 millimeters of mercury. And the partial pressure of oxygen in the systemic capillaries is 95 millimeters of mercury. So of course, we're gonna move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So oxygen is going to be driven into the cells because the pressure is lower there. And so of course, this will continue until we reach equilibrium. And once we do, then there is no more movement of oxygen, okay? So keep in mind, all right, we said that circulating blood, okay, the partial pressure, right, is not constant. But, all right, when we're dealing with our systemic cells, the partial pressure of oxygen will remain pretty much constant there. All right now, that's going to vary, obviously, depending on what those tissues are doing. Right? The obvious example is going to be exercising. Right? You'll obviously, when you are exercising, tissues, for example, muscle tissue, are going to need, have a higher metabolic demand. Right, and so they'll have an increased demand for oxygen. So that will change. But for most of the time, when we're at rest, like when you're watching this video here, right, that systemic cell partial pressure uh, uh, of oxygen will remain fairly constant. Okay, so when we talk about carbon dioxide, same type of scenario here that we saw before with external uh, respiration, all right, our partial pressure is gonna be driving the movement of carbon dioxide from the cells into the systemic capillaries. So when we're looking at the systemic cells, right? That partial pressure is 45 millimeters of mercury. And then when we look at the systemic capillaries, that partial pressure is 40 millimeters of mercury. So again, we're gonna flow down the partial pressure gradient. And we're gonna go from the tissues into the systemic capillaries. And again, this will continue until we reach equilibrium. Right? And that, of course, that equilibrium will be a 45 millimeter value. So if you look at the picture here, when we're dealing with oxygen, just follow the red arrow. You'll see here, and we'll talk about it here in a moment, all right, how this value, which we saw in the lungs, all right, in the pulmonary capillary, was 104 millimeters of mercury, it drops down. And part of that is because we're gonna be mixing some deoxygenated blood talk about that in a moment here. But when we get down to our systemic cells here, our partial pressure for oxygen in the blood is 95 millimeters of mercury. You'll notice it's less in the cells. So follow the red arrow, oxygen moves into the cells. And then just the opposite happens with carbon dioxide. Okay, partial pressure of carbon dioxide is greater in our cells than it is in the systemic capillary. So follow the blue arrow, carbon dioxide exits the cells. And all this continues until equilibrium is reached. So when we're looking here at this figure here, you can see, all right, what changes with the partial pressure of carbon dioxide and what changes with the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, so we're starting up here in our lungs, right? You'll notice when oxygen enters into the pulmonary capillary there, it has the same partial pressure as the um, alveoli, the air in the alveoli, which is 104 millimeters of mercury. But you'll see when it arrives at the 
um, systemic cells has decreased. And that's because we get a little bit a bit of mixing of blood. We get some deoxygenated blood that comes from the pulmonary vein. And so that is going to drop the partial pressure of oxygen from 104 to 95 millimeters of mercury. We briefly mentioned that in the second video here. And then of course, we'll have our gas exchange in the tissues and then the partial pressure of oxygen, right? When it's leaving the tissues is 40 millimeters of mercury. And when it arrives back into the lungs, okay? It will be at 40 millimeters of mercury, which is going to be significantly less than the partial pressure of the oxygen in the alveoli. So it makes it pretty easy for oxygen to diffuse into the bloodstream. And then of course, when we're talking about carbon dioxide, right? The partial pressure of carbon dioxide when it's leaving the lungs is 40 millimeters of mercury, right? It arrives at the tissues and you'll notice like we said on the previous slide, right? That carbon dioxide will exit from the systemic cells into the uh, blood and it'll increase the partial pressure, right? To 45 millimeters of mercury. And then when we arrive back into our um, lungs here, that 45 millimeters of mercury is greater than the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli. So carbon dioxide will diffuse across the pulmonary or respiratory membrane there and go into the alveoli, which then you will breathe out. All right, so let's talk about oxygen transport. Okay, how, all right, we saw, right, that yes, oxygen gets inhaled, right, enters into the blood, then travels to the systemic cells. But let's talk about how it travels to the systemic cells, right, and what factors um, will affect its ability to diffuse, all right, from the, uh, the blood into uh, the lungs or into uh, the tissue. Okay, so if you recall, in the second video, we talked about the solubility coefficient, right? And certain gases, all right, are more soluble in fluid, and in this case, it'll be blood, and some are less soluble. Well, oxygen has a very, very low solubility coefficient, all right? So we won't really see much oxygen dissolve directly in the plasma. So it needs a ride somewhere. Well, guess what? We got it, here it comes, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is that protein molecule that's going to transport oxygen via the red blood cells, the erythrocytes. It shuttles it around, okay? It's the Uber for oxygen. So what we'll see is, all right, the oxygen will directly attach onto the iron molecule that's located in hemoglobin. There's four of them. So it'll directly attach on. So one hemoglobin molecule has the potential to carry four oxygen molecules there. All right, so when we're looking at our blood, pretty much, all right, roughly about 98%, all right, of our oxygen in our blood is going to be attached onto the hemoglobin. Right, very little, again, is in the plasma because of that solubility coefficient. Nitrogen is even worse. Its solubility coefficient is much lower than oxygen's. Carbon dioxide, different story, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Okay, so when we're talking about oxygen when it's attached to hemoglobin, we write it down as this. HB stands for hemoglobin, right? We call that oxyhemoglobin. Right? When we don't have oxygen attached to the hemoglobin, we write it down as HHB or deoxyhemoglobin. All right, so some of you, when you've gone to your doctors, I use this all the time in my office, uh, we'll use a pulse oximeter. And so the nice thing about a pulse oximeter is that we don't have to draw blood, okay? So it's pretty much non-invasive. And so it's a nice way to measure how much oxygen, all right, is going to be attached onto the hemoglobin. Right, so it is a ratio of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. And normally we wanna see a reading greater than 95. <clears throat> All right, so 95 or greater, we're not worried too much. 
when you start to get down into the low 90s, God forbid you're in the 70s, 80s, there's a big, big, big problem going on. You know, and during this whole COVID thing, just a quick sidebar here, during the whole COVID thing, um, I had seen some videos on uh, YouTube in which people were saying that masks were cutting down and decreasing their um, uh, the, uh, amount of oxygen in their blood. And so I ran a little experiment. Now, granted, it wasn't a perfect experiment, all right? But I pretty much walked from the faculty parking lot up to the third floor of the building that I was teaching in, not a very far walk. But anyways, I had to go up three flights, consider myself to be in relatively good shape, not great shape, good shape. And I had a pulse oximeter with me and I wore my mask. And I pretty much walked in, walked up the stairs. And if anything, my um, hemoglobin saturation rate uh, may have dropped a single percentage, hardly any at all. That was just me. And again, it wasn't the perfectly constructed experiment, but anyways. So let's talk about carbon dioxide transport. Okay, keep in mind again, oxygen mainly is going to catch a ride with hemoglobin. Very little is, is going to be dissolved in the plasma. Now, carbon dioxide has a much higher solubility coefficient. So we're going to see a decent amount right, of carbon dioxide. When I see a decent amount, about 7% is going to be directly dissolved in the plasma. Okay. Some of our carbon dioxide will attach onto the hemoglobin. All right, about 23%, but it doesn't attach onto the iron. It attaches onto what we call the globin part of the, of the hemoglobin molecule there. So of course, we're going to denote that as HbCO2. Okay, and we call that carbinohemoglobin. But the majority of our uh, uh, carbon dioxide is going to be in the form of bicarbonate. We'll discuss what bicarbonate is in a moment, right? It's gonna be in the form of bicarbonate and it'll be dissolved directly in the plasma, okay? And that's gonna be about 70%, so that's a good amount. So we're now gonna talk about the process of how we wind up with this bicarbonate molecule, right? So. And, this, and you may have heard of the whole chloride shift, and we're going to get into that now. All right, so carbon dioxide is going to enter into our red blood cells. And in doing so, it combines with water to form the molecule bicarbonate and, and hydrogen. Remember the hydrogen ion, the H+, plus. we saw that in chapter two when we were talking about acids and bases, okay? And so we have a very special enzyme Right, carbonic anhydrase, this enzyme is going to create this bicarbonate molecule and a hydrogen ion. And as a result, once we form the bicarbonate ion, this ha is happening in the red blood cell, bicarbonate enters into the plasma, and then it'll diffuse, excuse me, not diffuse, then it'll dissolve into the plasma. Then when that bicarbonate, all right, arrives in the pulmonary capillaries, we're just going to undo this whole process. So let me show you this awesome picture here, okay? So you can see, let's see if we can fit this all in here. All right, so this is gonna happen here in our systemic cells, what you're seeing here, hence the systemic cell icon up here in the corner. All right, so carbon dioxide is in the blood plasma, and so it enters into our red blood cell, the erythrocyte, combines with oxygen, all right, with the use of carbonic anhydrase, this enzyme that will now form, all right, carbonic acid. And carbonic acid then will then turn into, all right, our bicarbonate ion and the hydrogen ion. Okay, so the bicarbonate ion is going to leave our uh, red blood cell and enter into the plasma and it'll flow along into the plasma there. As it exits chloride, all right, which sits outside here, okay, in the blood plasma, it will enter in. So that's what we call the chloride shift there, right? As the bicarbonate exits, the chloride enters. Now, don't forget about this guy because that can be an acidic, all right? Hydrogen ions, all right, this contributes to decreasing the pH, where well, we don't want that to happen. So we need to buffer that. If you recall, when you buffer something, you prevent 
all right, the change in the pH from swinging in either or direction, becoming either too acidic or too basic or alkaline. So what will happen is, all right, the hydrogen ion is going to attach onto the hemoglobin. And by doing so, we've buffered that. So that should not affect our pH, which is good because we want to keep our pH in that normal physiological range of 7.35 to 7.45. So roughly about 7.4, slightly basic. Okay. But again, if we start to drop in our pH value, become too acidic, then we start to get protein denaturation. And several other things can occur, right? But we want to prevent that because when we start to undergo protein denaturation, then we're going to damage our proteins. We don't want to do that. And we don't want to do that, okay? So keep in mind, this whole chloride shift, all right, is utilized because the bicarbonate is a negative ion. And so that negative ion shifts out here into the blood plasma. And so to offset that, then we have the movement of another negative ion or anion, and it enters into the red blood cell. So we want to equalize, all right, those charges there. We don't want to throw the whole thing off whack. So that's basically how the majority of carbon dioxide will travel here to the lungs. Now, when we get to the lungs, we're just gonna reverse the whole process, okay? So our bicarbonate enters into the cell and doing so, chloride exits out, okay? Keeping that balance in the electrical charge there. So the chloride has entered in, then the hydrogen ion comes off of the hemoglobin, all right, they both come together. They combine back into our, our carbonic acid here. And then that carbonic acid, same enzyme, okay, is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. And carbon dioxide then exits out of the red blood cell and then enters into the alveolus and you exhale it out. And that is how the majority of our carbon dioxide moves throughout our blood. All right, so a couple points here to keep in mind. Oxygen attaches to the iron molecule and hemoglobin, right? And carbon dioxide, right? When it directly uh, uh, binds onto hemoglobin, it will uh, bind onto the globin part of hemoglobin. And so will those hydrogen ions that we saw that result of uh, bicarbonate formation. Now, one of the things you have to understand is, is when these processes occur, right? When things are attaching onto the hemoglobin molecule, the hemoglobin molecule is going to undergo a conformational shape change, <coughs> excuse me. And this shape change then is going to affect hemoglobin's ability to bind further substances or to release the other substances, right? And so those three substances are oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen. So when one of those things binds onto the hemoglobin, it can affect how it releases the other two or how it can bind further other things. And so we're going to talk about some of those things. But first, we need to discuss the oxygen hemoglobin, hemoglobin saturation curve. So, of course, we like to graph this stuff of how when hemoglobin binds on, excuse me, when how oxygen binds on to hemoglobin, right, how the hemoglobin, hemoglobin's affinity to bind more oxygen will change. Because keep in mind, right, we can attach four oxygen molecules because we have four iron atoms in a hemoglobin molecule. So as we increase the amount of oxygen that binds onto hemoglobin, we are going to see all right, a shape change that, remember that conformational shape change that I just mentioned previously, all right, which will make it easier to attach more oxygen. Right, so going back to that pulse oximeter, right, when we're monitoring the percent of oxygen that is saturated on hemoglobin, right, it's very important that it attaches onto the hemoglobin because we need to transport oxygen throughout the body. And so we don't want to have 
a low oxygen saturation, we want to have a high oxygen saturation. So how do we change, all right, or how do we get more oxygen onto hemoglobin? Well, one, we can increase the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, so if we increase the partial pressure of oxygen, we get what's called the cooperative binding effect. And so as one oxygen attaches onto the hemoglobin molecule, then it makes it even easier for a second one to bind on. And when that second one binds on, then that makes it even easier for the third one to bind on. So that's the cooperative effect. All right, so again, we want, this is very important. So of course, now we're gonna graph this this whole relationship here, and we're going to show the graph as an S. It looks like an S-shaped curve. So here you can see when we have just one molecule of oxygen attaching onto, right, and that's at a relatively low partial pressure, right? The percent of oxygen then will directly shoot up, all right, to at the next partial pressure around 40, we get it to about 75. So what this graph is showing you, like I said, all right, the lower this, the partial pressure is, all right, the, uh, the more we can increase the percent of oxygen that saturates that hemoglobin. And as you can see, as we increase the partial pressure here, where you go from 20 over to 80 here, all right, look at what our value is. We're sitting around 95. Right here. Right, so we just start to drive up that pressure. So let's look at what the partial pressure is in the lungs, right? About 104. So in the lungs, the oxygen saturation for hemoglobin is at about 98%. But when we're down in the tissues, right, where it's about 40, even in the tissues, still about 75% of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. Still pretty good, but it always wants to, to grab on to more. All we have to do is drive up that partial pressure for oxygen, and then more oxygen will bind onto that hemoglobin molecule there. All right, so basically on that graph, that's what we saw, right? With, all right, those small increases in the partial pressure of oxygen, we saw huge changes there. You'll notice here in the beginning, this steep, this steep, this curve is relatively steep right here. So you can even see by the values here on our chart, <clears throat> you look at the values here on the chart, right? When we go from just a partial pressure of 30 to 40, it increases 57% to 75%. That is a huge, huge increase, hence that steep uh, slope there on our chart there. Then we start to slow down, and that's usually after about 60%, all right, uh, not 60%, at the partial pressure of 60 millimeters of mercury. Now we start to slow down because we go back here, you can see, all right, at partial pressure of oxygen at 60, we already have 90% of that hemoglobin is saturated there. So we'll have to increase that partial pressure even more. But again, like I said before, when we're in the lungs, pretty much the major, the whole of the hemoglobin molecule is going to be saturated. The only way to get it 100% saturated is for pure oxygen. And we see that like in the hyperbaric chambers there. Okay. So certain elevations, all right, are going to affect all right, our oxygen saturation depending on what the partial pressure is going to be. Obviously, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be less if we increase our altitude. At sea level, at one atmospheric, all right, it's pretty high. Right? The partial pressure in the actual atmosphere is about 152 millimeters of mercury, all right, in the actual pulmonary. Uh, portion of the lungs there, the alveoli, it's 104. But when we start to increase in elevation, 5,000 feet to 17,000 feet, you'll see at 5,000 feet, the partial pressure of oxygen is 81%. So we won't be able to saturate 
our hemoglobin as well as we could at sea level because the partial pressure at sea level is much higher. And even less so at 17,000 feet, think of mountain climbers, people that are trying to summit Mount Everest, okay? That partial pressure is, in, is half of what it is at 5,000 feet, 40 millimeters of mercury. And so our hemoglobin saturation rate is even less. It's only at 75, 75%, which brings us to altitude sickness, right? If you are unable to get enough, all right, oxygen, all right, delivered to the tissues, you can have some pretty bad symptoms here. where we start to really mess with the physiology in our bodies. And that is all due to the decrease in the alveolar, alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. And therefore, if the partial pressure of oxygen is significantly decreased, then our hemoglobin saturation is gonna be significantly decreased. Starts off with headaches, okay? Upset stomach, nausea. Then things start to really get bad when you're dealing with pulmonary edema, you start to get swelling and, 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 and fluid um, accumulation in the lungs. And then things get really, really bad because if that fluid accumulation occurs in the brain, you know, you could wind up in a coma or dead. So that's why these mountain climbers have to be very, very careful and they have to acclimate themselves to these high altitudes. That's why you can't just go and climb a mountain in, a, in a, a, a couple of days and then come back down and be fine, right? It takes many, many weeks to do that because you have to acclimate themselves, all right? And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll gradually move up in elevation, stay there for a little bit, and allow their body to acclimate through the process of, remember EPO, erythropoietin, we need to start to increase our red blood cell count, and in doing so, you increase your red blood cell count, you'll produce more hemoglobin molecules for those red blood cells, so you can actually bind more oxygen that's available. Not that the fact that oxygen is more available at higher altitudes, but those hemoglobin molecules to those new red blood cells can bind whatever oxygen is available at that altitude. Okay, so, Oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve, keep in mind, all right, when we're looking at this, not all of the oxygen is going to come off of the hemoglobin molecules when that red blood cells, when that red blood cell arrives at the systemic capillaries. And now when it leaves the lungs, we saw on our graph, it's at 104 millimeters of mercury, it's at 98%, all right? But when it gets to, all right, the systemic cells at 40 millimeters of mercury, we're at 75% saturation. So like I said, not all of it is going to be released, which is important, right? Because this is at rest, right? So when you're not exercising, you don't want to get rid of, it's just like uh, when you're playing poker, you don't want to go all in, okay? Because then you don't have anything else to go with. Well, same thing here, right? Your red blood cell doesn't want to give up all of the oxygen all right, that is bound to the hemoglobin molecules, all right? So it only gives off a small amount of it, about 20, 25%. Now, when you start to exercise, that's a different story. And we'll talk about that, right? So the amount of oxygen that remains on the hemoglobin, once those red blood cells have moved through our systemic circulation, we call that oxygen reserve. Again, this will provide that extra oxygen just in case you start to have increased metabolic demands, i.e. exercise, i.e. if you are sick, all right, and you start to have uh, immune responses to an infection for whatever reason, all right? Now, when you start to exercise, we're going to see a large decrease in the saturation rate. We might only have about 35% of our hemoglobin being saturated because we increase the metabolic demand for those tissues, i.e. skeletal muscles when you're exercising, right? We need to supply, all right, those skeletal muscles with the oxygen that they need for aerobic cellular respiration to generate that ATP. And so more oxygen will come off, which brings us, all right, to, all right, how, what variables, right, all the different things 
that can influence oxygen being released from our hemoglobin when it is circulating through our blood in the systemic circulation. Temperature is a great example. When we increase the temperature, right, which happens when you're working out, when you're exercising, that elevated temperature is going to make it harder for hemoglobin to hold on to oxygen, which is good because we don't want hemoglobin to have a tight grip on the oxygen. We want, to, we want it to be able to give that oxygen up easily, okay? We've got enough problems, you know, when we're trying to get fuel, all right, for our metabolism, for exercising tissues. So we don't want to have to fight with hemoglobin to give up its oxygen. So increasing the temperature, right, as what happens when you're uh, strenuous exercising, right, we are going to decrease all right, hemoglobins hold on oxygen. So oxygen pops off the hemoglobin molecule and diffuses into the tissues. Great, all right? How about hydrogen ion binding? Okay, remember when we were talking about the formation of bicarbonate, hydrogen is gonna bind on to hemoglobin, all right? So when hydrogen binds on, the hydrogen ion molecule binds onto hemoglobin, all right? It's going to cause that hemoglobin to undergo a shape change. And that shape change causes a decreased affinity for oxygen or a decreased hold on oxygen. So again, oxygen can pop off. We call that the Bohr effect. Now, again, think about it. When you are exercising, okay, strenuous activity, you are generating lactic acid, okay? All right, and lactic acid, right, can help contribute to an increase in hydrogen ion concentration. In addition to what we were talking about with the bicarbonate too, keep in mind, all right, that's another way that we can get hydrogen ions contributing to, all right, the uh, binding of hemoglobin. Now there's this other uh, substance or molecule called our 2,3-BPG, right? And this is a molecule that we find only in erythrocytes. I shouldn't say only, but it's found in erythrocytes, right? And again, when this molecule forms, right, it will cause a, an increase in the release of oxygen. Certain hormones are going to affect, all right, or produce this 2,3-BPG, okay, thyroid, epinephrine, growth hormone, testosterone, all these things produced, right, in relatively large amounts in our young people. Okay, and of course, carbon dioxide binding on the hemoglobin, again, will cause that conformational uh, shape change. And when it causes that sh shape change of hemoglobin, okay, it will then increase the release of oxygen from hemoglobin. All right, then we have our halidane effect. Here we'll see when we have that shape change of hemoglobin, Right, that we can see with that carbon dioxide that we just mentioned, that halidane effect will cause that increased release of oxygen from the hemoglobin due to the binding of the carbon dioxide to the molecule there. So that saturation curve that we talked about just a few moments ago, right, it can shift to the right or the left. Right? And if it shifts to the right, all right, what we'll see is any variable that causes it to shift to the right will then cause a decrease oxygen affinity for hemoglobin, meaning oxygen will pop off a of hemoglobin easier. We call that a right shift, right? And that's what we were just talking about with the increase in temperature, increase in hydrogen ion uh, uh, binding to uh, uh, hemoglobin, carbon dioxide binding to hemoglobin, the formation of 2,3-BPG, all, right, all that causes a right shift. Now, of course, we will also have a left shift. The left shift is the things that will increase oxygen, oxygen's affinity for hemoglobin, which means it makes it tougher for oxygen to pop off. All right, we'll see that when we have decreased temperatures, all right, or if we decrease our hydrogen ion concentration, or that binding of hydrogen ion concentration onto our hemoglobin molecule. So here you can see all the various things that will cause 
all right, a right shift. This is going, all of these things will promote oxygen to decrease its affinity for hydrogen ion, all right? So for example, when we increase our, when our partial pressure oxygen levels within the blood, all right, this right here, all right, normally this is what we see, all right? Oxygen popping off at the normal rates here, okay? that we talked about earlier, okay? 75% of our hemoglobin will still have, excuse me, our hemoglobin molecule will still be saturated at a value of 75%. That is our oxygen reserve, All right? Now, if we increase our temperature here, right? Then hemoglobin's affinity or oxygen's affinity for hemoglobin decreases and it leaves the hemoglobin and diffuses into the tissues here. And you can see here, right, we have our right shift occurring. Here's our normal body temperature, 38 degrees Celsius. <laughs> Excuse me. And then, <clears throat> oh, my bad, not 38 degrees Celsius. All right, and then you can see, all right, we get that right shift here. We go up to 43 degrees Celsius. I don't, I'm all over the place right now. 38 degrees Celsius is our normal body temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? Then we increase the temperature, all right? And you'll notice, all right, we get that right shift here and our saturation level decreases. It goes from 80% saturation of hemoglobin to 60% uh, saturation of hemoglobin just from that right shift. Here, we can see the Bohr effect, increase our hydrogen ions, all right? Um, that causes oxygen then to pop off because that conformational uh, shape change, oxygen will pop off the hemoglobin, diffuse into the tissues here. And so you can see our values here. Here's our normal blood uh, pH value of 7.4, okay? And then when we decrease the pH value to 7.2, you'll notice then, all right, our saturation of oxygen for hemoglobin decreases. All right, here's the 2,3 BPG. Same thing, all right? And then of course, when carbon dioxide, the halandate effect, the carbon dioxide bumps on, or hops on to the hydrogen, excuse me, to the hemoglobin, it causes oxygen to have less affinity for that hemoglobin and it pops off and diffuses into the tissues. All of those cause our right shifts, which leads me into carbon monoxide, which I talked about before. Now consider carbon monoxide as loving hemoglobin. It loves hemoglobin more than hydrogen. It loves hemoglobin more than carbon dioxide. It loves hemoglobin way more than oxygen. And so what will happen is when you have carbon monoxide poisoning, that carbon monoxide, all right, is going to prevent oxygen from binding on to the hemoglobin. And you could, this is potentially fatal. We've all heard the stories about the person sitting in the garage, all right, with the car running. Okay, well, this is what happens. Oxygen cannot bind onto the hemoglobin. If it can't bind onto the hemoglobin, we cannot oxygenate our tissues. And so you have tissue hypoxia. And then eventually, if it's severe enough, you can get tissue death, right? So because of this interference, we increase the risk and the severity of atherosclerosis, okay? Which is that placking of our blood vessels here. And if that increases, then we increase the resistance, all right, for blood flow, therefore blood flow decreases. So now we've decreased our blood flow. And so if we decrease blood flow, then we are depriving our systemic cells and tissues from getting any nutrients like glucose or proteins or fats or oxygen. And that's bad. So how do we treat it? Again, hyperbaric chamber. Throw them in, hyperbaric chamber with tons of oxygen. You're just blasting pretty much pure oxygen and that pure oxygen forces the carbon monoxide off of the hemoglobin, causes that carbon monoxide to stop interfering with the oxygen's ability to bind onto the hemoglobin. You're good to go. All right, so let's finish up and talk about hyperventilation and hypoventilation. Right, when we're dealing with all right, our cardiovascular function. Okay, hyperventilation is increased 
Ventilation increased breathing rates. Hypoventilation is going to be decreased. So hyperventilation, we're increasing our breathing rates above, uh, excuse me, increasing the breathing rate and or the depth above the body's demand, okay? Anxiety attacks can cause this. When you climb at higher altitudes, if you're up hiking in uh, the mountains up in uh, the Himalayas, right? This is going to increase your breathing rate and the depth of breathing. So when this occurs, we are going to see an increase in the partial pressure of, carb, uh, of oxygen, and we will see a decrease in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the air of the alveoli. Now, here's the thing, right? We can only saturate our hemoglobin so much. And so that's what happens. We're at sea level. So we can only get so much oxygen onto our hemoglobin, right? And that's at 98%. So that the, the oxygen doesn't really doesn't really come into play here. But what we really see is we see a loss of carbon dioxide because we're breathing it off more. Okay, and so we breathe off the carbon dioxide, more of that carbon dioxide comes out of the blood into, uh, into the gas that you then diffuses across the alveoli and you exhale it. So we call that hypocapnia. All right, so because we now have decreased our levels of carbon dioxide, we are going to C, vasoconstriction. And so that vasoconstriction, right, if it gets bad enough in the, in the brain, if we see vasoconstriction in the brain significantly, then we are going to be depriving oxygen to the brain. And we all know that that's a bad thing. And so you have a very short period of time, right, that you can have decreased oxygen delivery to the brain. Four to six minutes, I've seen four to eight minutes, okay? But that's not a good thing. As a result too, with hyperventilation, okay, we will see a decrease in the amount of the hydrogen ion in our blood, H plus. And we'll talk more about this when we get into the metabolism, but of course, all right, this is one of our buffering systems, right, is our breathing. The kidneys play a larger role in buffering our blood, right? But, okay, if our buffers in our blood can't compensate for this, right, we call that respiratory alkalosis because we are decreasing, all right, our blood hydrogen ion concentration. That's respiratory alkalosis because we're decreasing the hydrogen ion concentration. So if any of you have ever experienced hyperventilation, right, you may experience some dizziness or maybe feeling faint. And of course, then some of the other symptoms that you may experience, numbness, tingling, cramps, and tetany, sustained muscle contractions. If this continues for a long period of time, right, then, all right, if you stay at those high levels there of, of altitude, okay, you could pass out. Like I said before, you can have coma and possibly death. So hypoventilation. Now we're going to slow down our breathing. All right, we call that um, bradypnea. And then if we uh, make our breathing shallow, hypopnea is when we make our breathing too shallow. So pneumonia can cause this airway obstruction, literally if you swallow something, right? If you damage your respiratory centers, brain uh, stem injury, a litany of other respiratory conditions, right? That can cause this. What we'll see with hypoventilation is now we decreased our oxygen levels and our carbon dioxide levels have increased in the alveoli. So because we've decreased the levels of oxygen in our lungs, then our partial pressure of oxygen in our blood decreases. We call that hypoxemia. And then if it gets to the tissues and that um, oxygen levels are low in the tissues, we call that hypoxia. 
And because we saw increased levels, all right, of carbon dioxide in, in the uh, alveoli, right, we'll see in our blood, our partial pressure of carbon dioxide increases, and we, haul, we call that hypercapnia. So our decreased blood, uh, the partial pressure of, the, uh, uh, of our blood oxygen has decreased. We are not able to deliver enough oxygen to those tissues there. And so those tissues, their metabolic demand increases, all right? Or not, I shouldn't say increases, but their demand, well, yeah, metabolic demand increases. And we can see an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration, right? And that is a result of our increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. We have more carbon dioxide in the blood. And of course, we saw how um, carbon dioxide travels in our blood, right? Through bicarbonate, right? And we're creating more bicarbonate. And therefore, we're increasing the hydrogen ion concentration. And we'll see respiratory acidosis. Some of the symptoms, tiredness, sleepiness, weakness, headaches, all right, polycythemia, all right? We get a thickening of our blood, cyanotic tissues, decreased oxygen delivery to our tissues, all right? If this continues on for a while, you can have convulsions and then again, pass out and then die. All right, so we've always talked about the, the quiet breathing, the eupnea, Right, so when we are exercising, we increase our respiration rate. Hyperpnea, and that is because we need to meet the metabolic demands that our tissues are asking of us. All right, so here's a couple of things that we are going to see. All right, we are going to increase the depth right, of our breathing but our rate remains the same. So the blood concentrations of oxygen and carbon dioxide will stay the same, relatively constant for the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So keep in mind, all right, we can increase, all right, the amount of oxygen that we're taking in if we increase the depth of our breathing because we are increasing the thoracic cavity volume. We increase the thoracic cavity volume, we increase the pressure gradient, then we increase the airflow, and so we can get more oxygen in. So also, one of the ways that we can compensate for metabolic demands, we'll also see increased cardiac output. If we increase our cardiac output, will increase our blood flow to those tissues. And so in the respiratory center, right, we talked about different uh, factors that control the nerve, the different nervous uh, system controls for your breathing. We talked about proprioception or proprioceptors as one of those. And that's because if you're exercising, you increase your movement, you're going to increase the proprioceptive sensory signals to the respiratory center. So they'll respond to that, right? We'll also see, all right, an increase in the motor output there in the frontal cortex from the cerebral region there. And that will also, those signals, some of those signals will travel to the respiratory center to help increase blood flow through cardiac output, all right, in our deeper breaths. And of course, there's always our consciousness that's gonna play a role where you can actually physically, all right, increase your breathing rate voluntarily or not. All right, folks, that's the end of that. I hope you enjoyed the video. Good luck. I wish you well.